Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, everyone. Let's give a round of applause to the Lord. Let's celebrate our Father. Amen. We want to welcome you all. We want to welcome you all this evening. Thank you for coming out to Turning Point Fellowship, a place where you matter and your story isn't over yet. Amen. We want you to know that and remember that. Amen. We want to uh, welcome all those on Facebook Live and YouTube. Thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you guys. You guys may be seated. I'm going to run through just a, a couple of things that we have going on uh, this upcoming month in the month of November. Amen. We want to make sure. I mean, I'm sorry, November. I'm ahead. Whoa. Man, I'm in, I'm in a rush. Slow down, Brother Thomas. Slow down. February. Thank you, Bobby, Sister Bobby Joe. So we want to we wanna just keep you up to date with what's going on here at Turning Point Fellowship for the month of February. Amen. So you see here we have our men's meeting, Men of a Higher Standard, on February 4th at 9 a.m. Come on out, Facebook, YouTube, come on out and be blessed. I guarantee you will leave blessed. Uh, this particular men's meeting, we will be having the barbecue uh, grill out. So for those of you in the house, go ahead and bring something to cook. Bring a side dish, potato salad, macaroni salad, whatever your heart desires. We will be on the grill as well. Amen. And following that is February 5th, which would be our, our monthly potluck. And it is a tailgate style theme. Bring your favorite dish. The barbecue grill will be out. And we're just going to we're going to have a good time. Amen. After service, we're going to come that Sunday, worship the Lord. Amen. Receive a great word. And we also like to fellowship after with some good food. Amen. So we invite you out, Facebook. We invite you out. YouTube. Come on out and be a part of what Turning Point Fellowship is doing. And next, we have our women's meeting. Where are women at? <laughs> Woo! They're here. They're in the house. Amen. Saturday, February 11th. So that's, follow, that's the following Saturday of the men's meeting. At 10 a.m., right here in the sanctuary, Sister Bobby Mayer will be speaking. Amen. <laughs> If you guys have any questions regarding the women's meeting, please get with Sister Bobby Joe, Sister Margarita. And also, if you have any questions regarding the men's meeting, you can get with myself, Brother Fred. We can get with one of us. We'll let you know what's going on. And for the, uh, the potluck, you can get with Sister Arlena or Sister Marlene. Amen? Here it is, women of virtue. You guys have been waiting a whole year. This May, this May, this May. We will be having the Women of Virtue Women's Conference, and that will be from May 19th through the 21st. Amen. And the cost is $190. It includes two nights, five meals. They, all they're asking is a $50 deposit to secure your bed. Women, for those of you on Facebook, because a lot of you come out, come out to this uh, uh, advance, Women's Advance. Make sure to get your money in. There's only 70 spots available, and May will come quickly. So we encourage you to see Sister Bobby, see one of the leaders of the women's ministry, and get your money in. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet, family, as we enter in to worship the King of Kings. Amen. And the Lord of Lords. Thank you, Father. I'm going to read a brief scripture out of Psalms 95. Amen. And the word of God says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord God is great and a great king above all gods. Family, this evening... As we begin to worship, I invite you to come to the foot of the cross. Come and lay down any burden, any weight, anything that you might be carrying this evening. Come, amen. Father, we thank you, Father, for another opportunity to be in your house, to come into your presence. We honor you, Lord. We bless you. Father, we worship you. May it be a sweet-smelling aroma into your nostrils. Father, may we worship you like never before with open hearts and lifted up hands. May we surrender to you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And the church and I said, amen, amen, and amen.
Come on, family. Worship your king. Open up the floodgates, Almighty River, flowing 
from your heart, filling every part of our praise. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're here. Yeah. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're singing. Hallelujah. why I'm here. You see me smiling? He's the reason why I'm smiling. He's the reason my family is still intact. He's the reason why I live. He's the reason that I'm free to worship him. Worship him with the freedom that he's giving you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we worship you, Father, because of who you are, Lord. Because of who you are, Lord. Because of who you are, Lord. Lord.
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was fallen. The precious blood.
And me 
presence of the Lord is here again. You may take your seats in the stand of uh, the attitude of worship and prayer. Thank you. I was asked to come and take the offering tonight, so um, I just want to set the stage for just a second. I'm going to read from the book of Malachi, but I want to read you something. It says, Malachi holds a mirror before us, helping us to assess our relationships with the living God. Do we believe he loves us? Yes and amen. Does he have our wholehearted love and obedience? Yes and amen. Or are we only going through the motions? God's question to Israel sneaks behind the defenses and shakes us out of more of our routine, igniting new affections from him. Amen? So tonight, all day today, since early this morning, I kept thinking, I kept hearing the word seeds and storehouse. So the scripture tonight I'm going to read is from Malachi 3, 10 through 12. If you want to follow along, please. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that there would not be light. Sorry, I was going to go with verse 11, but I'm going to read verse 10. I'm sorry, I'll start all over. Forgive me. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light our useless fires on the altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. And I will accept no offerings from your hands. My name will be great. I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm so sorry. But that was a good verse. <laughs> that was a holy, that was a good word. Read it tonight when you go home. That's a good word. Bring your whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent the pest from the devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful Land, says the Lord Almighty. Amen? Amen. That's a good verse, too. So tonight, my question is to you is, where are you planting your seeds? And what are you bringing into the storehouse? We need to be serious, and we need to bring a pure, unblemished tithe to the storehouse. We're giving it to the Lord. Amen? Amen. We're giving our surrendered heart to God Almighty so he can bless us your households, your land, amen, and bless the land here with, at Turning Point. So with the seeds, I want to share this with you. I think it's on this side. There's weeds outside. There's a planter. But back in October, in November, those weeds weren't there. But now those weeds are there, and they're growing, and it just seemed like those weeds came overnight, Amen. They're full of weeds because the rain came, and they are overgrown. We know they're weeds because we recognize them. We can see them. We can touch them. I don't know if we can smell them, but we know that they're there. But when are we going to go pull up those weeds and pull them out of our gardens, the garden of our heart? Amen? Can we see the weeds in our hearts? No, we can't, but God can. But we can see the weeds by how we talk. Are we blessing the Lord? We can see the weeds by how we are following after God. We can see the weeds. How we act. Don't let those weeds become a stronghold in your heart. 
Are we bringing our tithes and offerings with a pure heart and unblemished? Or are we bringing secondhand tithes? <laughs> How we act, are we following up God's heart and living by his principles? If we want our land and our hearts to be pure and filled with the blessings of God, we need to follow God in his ways. We need to trust God with our lives and trust God with our finances to live the abundant life he has waiting for you where there is more than enough. Amen. So if you want to give your tithes and offerings, please, the ushers will pass out the envelopes. But we also have tech, tithes to text, text and give. But there's something I want to share about this phone number. I don't know if you guys ever really look at the phone number. 714-477-7736. Okay, one more time, kids. 714 477 Seven seven three six. I've been looking at this number and I know what it means. Seventy-seven is the year I got married, but seventy-seven is the year of jubilee. Seven-seven, the year of jubilee. Seven-seven, the year of jubilee. Double blessings, double blessings. Amen. Double blessings, double blessings. So come and give. Hallelujah. This is my. This is my desire.
soul. Lord, I give you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment. Brother Fernando and Sister Raina come and pray for the offering tonight. Estiende sus manos, por favor. Benito Padre Celestial, te damos gracias por este maravilloso día, Señor. Por este momento Señor tan especial Que venimos delante de ti Señor A darte un poquito de lo mucho que tú nos has dado Nos has dado más de suficiente Señor Y venimos en este día a, a dártelo Señor Gracias Señor por bendecirnos Señor Gracias Señor por esos trabajos que, que tú nos has dado Señor Gracias Señor porque tenemos de comer Señor te, tú, tú has llenado todo, todo, cumplido todo lo que has hecho Señor en nuestras casas Señor nuestra renta, nuestros biles han sido pagados Señor, gracias Señor que no solamente tenemos un carro, tenemos dos carros, pero nos bendices de cualquier manera Señor, tú nos has bendecido Señor y te damos gracias Señor, bendice esos diezmos y esas ofrendas Señor que sean que, que cuando la gente lo trajo Señor, lo trajo de todo corazón para tu gloria Señor que esos diezmos y ofrendas Señor sean para, ese, uh, para que siga tu gloria en este lugar Señor. Para esos corazones que vienen Señor, esas vidas que vienen Señor. Ser cambiadas, transformadas Señor. Te damos gracias Padre. Father we just thank you right now Father for this tithe and this offering Lord. Father we ask that you would bless it Father for your kingdom Father. Father, we ask that you would use it, Father, for those who are lost and hurting, Father. Those who have left you, Father, bring them back home to you, Lord. Father, we ask, Father, for each and every household that is represented here, Father, that you would bless the marriages, the children, the youth, Father, the hurting, Father, the sick, Lord. Father, we ask for those strongholds that are, that are binding them from, keeping them from drawing closer to you, Father. We ask that this would be used, Father, to glorify you, Father, and release them and free them, Father, to draw closer to you. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would multiply it, yes. Father. Bless Pastor. Bless his family, his generations after, Father, that he would not grow weary in doing your will, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do, Father, for this is just a little bit, Father, of all that you give us, Lord. Yes. Father, you've given us more than enough, Lord. We ask that you would just use this, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, we'll dismiss the worship team, amen. amen. So tonight we're going to have a really good special. Good. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I'm nervous. What can I say? I'd like to introduce Pastor Joe to come up and give us the word tonight. Amen. A warm welcome. Okay. What about the kids? Kids staying in? Kids, go get them. Yeah. 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 That really is our next generation here. That's turning point 
next generation when we start getting old. You know, so you better pray for them. They're going to treat you good. Okay, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Okay, Father, we come to you right now, Lord. We just pray that as the word goes out, Lord, the Holy Spirit fills this place, fills each and every one of us, Lord. And there's someone here that doesn't know you. I pray that today would be the day, Lord, that they would know you personally, Lord. Father, move in your word, Lord. Move in our hearts to receive it, Lord. Fertile ground. Have your will here, Father. Anything that would just sidetrack us, take it out of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Have a seat, folks. Okay. Come on, Pastor Angel. A while back, Pastor Angel asked me to, to do something on ministry. And I started to, to put it together. And it's really funny because you know what? One of the verses that I'm going to start off with is 2 Thessalonians 3.13. It says, but as for you, brethren... Do not go weary in doing good. Fred, what was this morning's verse? That's for you, brother. Do not go weary in doing good. <laughs> now, Amen. I had to chuckle because there is no random chance with the Lord. As believers, our steps are ordered by the Lord. Amen. Now, because I am just a rebel... I was sitting there last week and I was hearing, I was listening to a really good study, Noah and the fallen angels and all the stuff that was tickling my ears. And I said, hey, maybe I ought to do it on that. And I said, no, Pastor Angel asked me to do it on ministry. So, and, I, and, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, ministry is pretty straightforward. You know, I don't want to bore anybody, but I heard that this morning and I was just like, wow, Lord. You're starting off the day prepping the people for ministry. So ministry is what he wants you to hear, and ministry is where we're going to go. And uh, uh, as with everything I do, I'm going to give you a story. A couple years ago, I was getting ready to do a service inside the Orange County Jail. I was a chaplain there. Make a long story short, it was Saturday night. I get up to the module. I finally get situated. I'm sitting down at the table, breaking open the Bible, waiting for them to bring the, the inmates up. What do you think happens? After I get through security and everything, the lights go out. The lights go out. A couple seconds later, the minimum lights come on, along with a horn in the background. And I'm like, really? <laughs> okay. Any other place, this would be a non-event. But in jail, nope. They're worried about it in the confusion and everything that goes with it that somebody's going to be trying to escape. So this is a full lockdown. Now the place is locked down. There's nobody coming up here. There is no Bible study. So they do a full count. Every inmate had to be counted, make sure they're all, they're all in there. An hour goes by, and I'm sitting there saying, oh, well, so much for the Bible study. The lights come back on. And the all clear is sounded, and I'm like, really cool, okay. I'm going to get out of here on time. I kid you not. Two minutes later, before they could even let me out, the power dropped again. Well, what do you think happened? Horn goes off, count, 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 and I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. An hour later, they finally did the count. I finally got out of there. Now, it's Saturday night. I was supposed to have a guy with me. He didn't show up. So I'm sitting here going, everything is just going against this. I get out of there, and, and I'm walking out of the jail and going, really? I am just not feeling this. Is this the way it is, Lord? Now, if you've ever ministered, if you've ever witnessed, if you've ever shared the gospel with people, I guarantee you, you're also going to have some tough, trying times when you feel like, wow, this is ministry? Now... Today, I'm going to give you a few reasons on why ministry is really where it's at. Ministry is what we're called to, and ministry is where we as believers need to be. First, I want you to consider, who are the people in your life that you most respect? More than likely, it's going to be the people that are sold out for the Lord, the people that are eating, breathing, everything, Jesus Christ. That's our common bond. 
That's the bond we share with them. They're faithfully serving in ministry, and the Lord has called them. So I want to talk to the people. In the, uh, the first group of people I want to talk to is the groups that's sitting in the pew. You know the Lord is talking to you, but you're not getting involved. Now, in this group, it's very slim because you guys are the diehards. You're here on Thursday. You know 25% of the people statistically do 100% of the work in the churches. You know, and the ones that show up for the midweek study, that's them. So, we're going to talk about the other guys. The first group, they're called ministry. Story for you. Old Testament. Children of Israel are wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, wandering around on their way to the promised land. Although the locations changed, they went to the different campgrounds and everything was a little bit different. One thing stayed exactly the same, exactly the same. Numbers chapter 2, verse 17. I'm going to read it for you for the interest of time. And the tabernacle of meeting shall move out with the camp of the Levites in the middle of the camp. As they camp, so shall they move out, everyone in his place by their standard. The Ark of the Tabernacle, place of God's presence, the place where his glory resided, it was always, always in the middle of the camp. But notice who moved out with the tabernacle. Did you hear that? Catch that one? Who camped closest to the tabernacle, who got always got closest to the glory? It was the people who were involved in ministry, the people who ministered to the Lord, the people who actively participated, not the ones who sat on the sidelines. It was the Levites. And what was true then is true now. And by the way, what are you guys? God calls us, we're actually kings and priests in the kingdom. You have a place in ministry. The Levites were the ones that stood right there next to the ark. They were the ones that were involved in ministry, and those are the ones that were serving the Lord. Now, the people who clamp, clamp closest to the glory, those are the ones in ministry, closest to the place where you can serve, closest to the place where you can feel and enjoy fellowship, but also where you feel the presence of the Lord. You ever walk into church and you could feel the Lord's presence? Right. When you get involved in ministry, get ready because you will feel it. You will, the Lord is right there with you. Second point I want you to consider. I've met people. <laughs> These guys are pure evil. Worldly people that when they walk in the room, you can feel them. You can feel that darkness. Now, conversely, I've met Christians, really powerful men of, men of God. But when, when they walk in the room, you feel God's presence. You feel that just that solid Christian character right there. That's what happens. If you allow yourself to be taken over by the world, people are going to feel it. You allow yourself to be taken over by the Spirit, people feel it. These are the people that are actively involved in ministry to the Lord. They have a depth, they have a richness of character that you can feel it. Why? Because serving the Lord has benefits. Serving the Lord has personal benefits, but there's also much, much more. Now, I want to cover some things. We often hear, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Matthew 7, 2 says, to, to follow up with that, for what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is not just teaching, a, he's not teaching a prosperity doctrine here that only applies to money. Jesus is talking about your finances. Yes, if you give, you're going to be blessed. You can't outgive God. But this, but this principle goes much, much deeper than just your wallet. Okay? Now, you can't outgive God. Jesus is saying the degree that you give out will determine the degree that you give back. And that principle applies to everything you do as a Christian, especially when it comes to ministry. When it comes to ministry, whatever you do for others, the degree that you give out is the degree that you get back. 
Very important principle. If you're going to go out there and feed the homeless, if you're going to work in the nursery, if you're going to witness to the guy at work, if you're going to cut the grass in front of the building, ministry. That's ministry. And God is not going to forget it. It's ministry and it's, God, it's God's way to use you and develop you and develop your character, your Christian character. Now, John chapter 15, verse 16. It said, you did not choose, choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. The Lord ordained each of us to ministry, each and every one of us. There are no exceptions because when you look inside yourselves, if you really take a serious look, you're going to see just how empty you really are now. If you weren't sharing, if you weren't serving, if you weren't giving out to others, how much do you think would be in there? So what does God do? He uses ministry to develop godly character. He uses ministry to give you, me, us, a sense of purpose as Christians. Ministry to fulfill his desire in our lives. It's God from beginning to end. Why? So that we can bear fruit. You know? Rabbit trail. With my kids. If I take Josiah and I tell him, Josiah, come on, I'm going to pay you to cut the grass. This is, this is in, a, in a, a, a really bad analogy. I take Josiah outside, I pull out the lawnmower, I put some gas in it, I start it up, I go, come on, son, cut the grass. And he grabs the handle as I'm pushing it along and cutting the grass. I get the rake, I rake it up, he holds a little thing right there for me, I put it in the thing. After we're done, here you go, kiddo, here's five bucks. You did a great job. This is the Lord. This is the way he works in our lives. And he's building it, but from beginning to end, your ministry is his work, bearing fruit in your life. So when you die and you get to heaven, your 401k actually has something in it. So you, me, us, we're all called to ministry to one degree or another. The Father has given each of us gifts, gifts that are going to be used for his glory. Who gave you the ability to be a mechanic, to succeed in business, to play the guitar? Who gave you that ability? God did. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. John 3.27 adds to this when he says, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. So here's how it works. God gives us the abilities. He opens the doors for us to use those abilities. He anoints us to serve him. He empowers us to minister for him. He blesses the fruit of our labor. And then what does he do? He rewards us for doing it. From beginning to end, it's him. And just like my little guy, we walk up and go, I cut the grass. Okay, we're all in ministry in one form or another, every one of us. We may think we're not, but the Lord has called us to do something. It's not a matter of if you're called to the pulpit, the parking lot, or to parenting. Each of us is in a ministry. Consequently, if you're doing ministry right, you have an enemy. It's important to know how your enemy is going to work. Amen? So, more stories. I love the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18. What does it say? It says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and did not fear God. Israel is on their way to the promised land. Their enemy The Amalekites were lying in wait all along that route. They're picking off the people in the back, the people who were lagging behind, the people who were easy marks. Now, that principle applies. It applies to us now. In our Christian walk, the person that you don't want to be is the person that's just sort of spiritually lagging behind in their walk. The, the person who comes to church 
kind of involved. You know, I brought donuts for the men's breakfast, you know. And you don't see them for a couple weeks. You don't want to be that person. You, you don't want to be straggling along, bringing up the rear. That's exactly where the enemy is going to attack. Moses is laying out a principle here. This is the guy who says, hey, I can't read my Bible today. I don't have time. Sunday, up. Oh, Chargers are going to beat the Rams. I got to stay home and watch it. <laughs> All right, that was bad. You know, but, but it goes deeper, and it's true. I know I didn't do my family devotions, but it's so hectic with work. I'm beat. Got to do this stuff. We always got excuses. We are spiritually straggling behind the pack. Now, spiritually, it's easy to settle in. It's easy to lag behind. Before you know it, you're at the back. You're not sitting in the front. There was an old joke. We used to joke about the people who are getting ready to quit coming to church are the ones that are sitting in the back. All you in the back, don't worry. Ryan's guarding that door. (laughs) Just like in nature, the lion is not going to get up and chase the quick, healthy, young gazelle. Who's he going to go after? He's going to go after the old, fat, slow guy. You know, he doesn't want to work hard, just like us. He's going, after, he's going after that spiritual fat person. He's going after the ones who are lagging behind, the guys who are bringing up the rear, and they're barely trying to keep up. Now, spiritually, same principle applies. We're going to beat this point. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. What does it say? Easy one. I know you all know it. Be sober, be vigilant, because your, your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Who's he looking for? He's looking for spiritually weak Christians. Easy targets looking for stragglers. These are the people that he wants. They're the ones that are just sitting in the back waiting to be picked off. Now, being involved in ministry, what is it going to do? It's going to keep you up front. It's going to keep you in the fight. It's going to keep you involved. It's going to keep you at the tip of the spear right where God intends for you to be. Are you going to get tired? Absolutely. Are you going to want to pull back? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's our nature. We're human. In the story, Malachites are a picture of Satan. What is, Satan, what is Moses saying? Remember. Remember. He's telling the people, watch out. Your enemy is not going to attack you head on. He's not going to attack you face to face. You're expecting that. He's going to go to the back. Why? Because that's where you're most vulnerable. That's your weakest point. Simple lesson here. Get plugged in. Don't hang out in the back. These are the people the enemy wants. What was out front? Leading God. Leading God's people through the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant. The place where God's glory resided. Remember, the people who are closest to the Ark, the ones who were ministering to the Lord, did they get picked off? No. Why? They stayed up close. They stayed close to the Lord. They didn't let him get far away. What's the takeaway? Get involved. Stay involved. Don't sit in the back being spiritual fat little babies. Up until now, I'm talking to the folks that are failing to get fully engaged. But what about the other people? What about the people who are in ministry? The ones who are actively involved. Second group of believers, those who are faithfully serving. The people who may be getting tired, just like me, just like you, the ones that want to pull back instead of pressing in. There's something that can happen to any of us and we can say, hey, I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, whatever it is. I feed the homeless, I do Bible studies, I go to the jails, I teach on Thursdays. But you know what? Let somebody else go to nursery. Let somebody else go to the jails. Let somebody else lead the worship team. I'm tired. It's getting, this is, this is stress. Second Samuel chapter 11 has a story in there. It's a story of a powerful man of God, a man after God's own heart. I know you've all heard it before. He also got tired. We all know the story of King David. King David chose to stay back. He chose to take a break. His men were where? 
They were out on the battlefield, engaged in the battle. But what did David do? David, all he probably wanted to do was just stay home, relax on his roof, and just watch the sunset. I'm just taking a break. Now, looking down from the, from the, the, the roof of his palace there, what does he see? He sees a beautiful girl taking a bath, aptly named Bathsheba. David's getting old. He's getting tired. He's probably sincerely not expecting anything except my guys are out there. They got it under control. I killed Goliath. I've done all these great things. I'm tired. I'm, I'm not getting out of ministry. I'm just taking a break. Satan takes the opportunity to attack him. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but what happens? Lust, adultery, murder, a broken family, a dead son. You can go right down the list. Why? Because David wasn't in the place where David needed to be. There's many, many, many Christians now who are in very similar, they have very similar stories. You just bring it up a couple thousand years, the circumstances are the same. They all fell into sin after years of faithfully serving the Lord. The common thread, what's the common thread? It's a wrong mindset, it's a false belief that you know what, I'm justified in pulling back from ministry a little bit because after all, I've been faithfully serving. I put my time in, I just need a little break. Instead of pressing in with their ministry with the Lord, they were actually doing what? They were actually drifting back, pulling away. Did they intend to? No. But this mindset that I paid my dues, I'm good, Lord knows. He knows I still love them, but they pulled back. Now, sorry. Fellowship and ministry, two sides of the same coin. These folks believed that spending time with the Lord or with his people was no longer necessary to maintain their walk. False. It is important that we as believers are careful not to grow weary sometimes in middle age. You know, we think we're more seasoned and we're all set. No. Very dangerous position. You don't get better. The only only protection we have is where? Right next to the Lord. Right next to him. You get into this false mindset where you say, I fought the fight. Now it's time to cruise a little bit. The same principle applies to older believers as it does to younger believers. Those who've been serving the Lord for years apply the same principle. If you want to cruise, you're going to drift. You're going to drift. King David got picked off. Why? Because he decided to stay back out of the battlefield. He decided to kick back and cruise for a little while. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway If you want to pull back, drift back, take a break, Amalek is going to be right there waiting for you. He's got something for you. But there's another example. There's another pitfall in the New Testament. Once again, it's not an old guy. It's a seasoned believer. It's somebody that's been walking for a while. Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 35. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go after you to Galilee. Peter answered and he said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night, Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. And so said all the other disciples. They all chimed in, not us, every one of them. You got to love Peter. The guy is confident. I love this guy. He's just a big, burly guy. Reminds me of somebody here. (laughs) Peter stood there and he said, not me. Lord, I'm with you till the wheels fall off the chariot. I'm going down with you. I got your back. You can count on me. I believe he was sincere. But in just a couple hours, 
Jesus was going to be pulled. He'd be arrested, let off for a sham trial, and be hanging on the cross, dying for every one of our sins. But here's where we see the, tri- the spiritual trap of Moses unfolding in the life of Peter. It's time. This time is being played out in an apostle who is actively involved with Peter. You think you're strong? Peter walked with Jesus. He sat on the ground and had lunch with Jesus. He was as close as you can get to Jesus. But Peter did, Peter did what he said he would not do. He ran. He laid back and he followed Jesus from where? Far off. Far off. And Peter, I, if, if Peter can fall after knowing the Lord for three years, man, don't tell me that it can't happen to me, you, any of us. We have to watch out for this trap. He still followed Jesus. He was right there. He was not completely alienated, but he just didn't follow him closely any longer. He followed him from afar off. There was distance between him and Jesus. Are you guys seeing the trend here? Matthew 26, 58 says, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. The enemies of Jesus lit fires. Fires to what? Fires to take away the cold. But notice, there's something that was happening here in Peter. Peter wasn't so much cold on the outside. He was getting colder on the inside because of what was going on here. Peter was cold in his heart. He was cold in his soul. Why? Because spiritually, he wasn't where he should be. He knew, I'm not where I would be, could be, should have been. I ran. Instead of standing by the fires of the enemy, looking for warmth, somebody tells him, or while he's standing around the the enemy's fires, they're looking for warmth. Somebody tells Peter, you know you, you're one of the people who hung around with Jesus. What does Peter do? You're one of his followers. Peter says, no, I'm not. A young girl pipes up. Yeah, weren't you with Jesus? Peter insists, no way. Got the wrong guy. Another person climbs up. You're a Galilean. Peter, at this point, in Matthew 26, 74, then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately, a rooster crowed. Do you see the progression here? Followed him from far, started to take a little bit of refuge right around the enemy's, the enemy's fire, keeping warm. At this point, Peter swore. The original text says he swore vehemently, and it was like, my soul be damned if I know this guy. How far away do you get from the Lord after eating with him, having you know, deep, sincere fellowship right in front? This is where Peter was. No wonder after this, Peter was a broken man. You know, until he saw him, because it hurt that much. Peter loved the Lord, but he fell away. The same with all of us. We can do the same thing. We're just one step away. And how does it happen? By following the Lord from far off. Be careful if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling tired, that you don't buy into Satan's lie, believing I'm not what I should be, not what I used to be. I'm just going to follow Jesus from afar off. I, can't, I feel like I'm just not doing it. It was never about you. It was all about him. And he's not going to leave you. He's going to use you no matter where you are. You don't go by your feelings. Ministry. When you, follow from, fall, when you follow Jesus from far away, there's a chill that forms in your soul. And what does it do? It drives you to the enemy's fire. Now you find yourself going places, doing things, and saying things that if, if you were actively involved in ministry, you'd never do it. You'd never do it. But you decided to drift away. You opened the door to be warmed by the enemy's fire. And if you walk through that door, it's a trap. It's a trap. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, money, every foolish fantasy that the world has to offer, every one of them, it's a pitfall, it's a lie, right from the, right from the heart of Satan. If you fall prey to the attack of the enemy, if you allow your sins and former tendencies to drive you back 
from following Jesus closely if you decide to follow him far off. It's never going to end well. Amalek is waiting for you. So what do you do? You feeling tired? I'm talking to the, the, the people that are serving in ministry now. I'm not picking on you. I'm just, this is the warning. What do you do? You're feeling tired. You don't go back. You do not go back. You go to the front, to the place where the Lord wants you to camp. Okay? You go close to his presence, close to his glory, and what do you do? You rely on his strength. You don't pull back, you press in. More engaged, more involved. Now, the Lord has not called anybody to turn back. The armor of God, anything on the back? You turn around, what part do you think he's going to take the biggest chunk of? Don't turn around, don't go back. Always go forward. The secret to a good defense is what? A good offense. You commit to, re, to doing the spiritual work that the Lord has called you to. You know what he's put in your heart. You know where he wants you to be. Recommit, jump back in, and do it. Go back to where you were. Strong devotional life. Committed to service in ministry, to worship, to Bible study. And I, and I want to say that again, Bible study. How are you going to know the Lord's will for your life if you don't read his love letter? It's all right here. Rabbit trail. For those of you that are old enough to remember mail, <laughs> when we were in the service, if you got a letter from your girlfriend, you stood there and you read that letter and you read it again and you read between the lines and everything. Yeah, she's really saying this to me, you know. Okay. Apply that same intensity to your word. This word is deep and the Lord has so much he wants to talk to you and talk to you here. He wants to, he wants to take you into levels of fellowship that you've never experienced. The reason why you never experience them because you're watching the Chargers beat the Rams. <laughs> Where's Ralph? <laughs> okay. God knows you're tired. And what's his secret? What does he tell you to do when you're tired? He tells you to wait. Wait. Isaiah 40, verse 31 but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Why should we remain out front ministering to the Lord even when we're tired, even when we have, feel like we have nothing left to give? Because when we hang in there, when we press in, we don't get weaker. We get stronger as the Lord renews, replenishes, and restores your strength. That's his word. He can't lie. Wait on the Lord. I don't care how bad it seems, where you feel like you're at in ministry, wait, wait. God will restore you and God will build you up. Why? He's building up your character. Trust me. The same way you came to him at the cross in faith. What are you doing? You're living by faith. And we go from faith to faith. You feel tired? Just another battle. Wait, wait. There's times when I called, when I'm called to minister, and honestly, I just don't feel it. I know that people think that pastors are spiritual supermen. Only Pastor Eric. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, man. That was a cheap shot. <laughs> oh. There's times when everybody, every pastor, I don't care who you are, if you're in ministry, there's times when you're going to be called to minister and you just don't feel it. Right, you're amen. beat. You're beat. You're only human. But what do you do? For me, when I pressed in, when I obediently ministered, regardless of how I felt, it was always awesome. I always walked away with a renewed, renewed sense of purpose, yeah. a renewed sense of power. The jail ministry, I did Saturday nights. Everybody else was out having the barbecues and stuff. I was in there. Sometimes you just don't feel it. But I got to tell you, when I walked out of that module, 
and I just talked to the guy that was on death row. He was getting ready to go up to Quentin. I was built up. A renewed sense of purpose, a renewed sense of power as you watch the Lord minister through you to others. It's the way he works. Wait. Wait on the Lord. I'm amazed at how often the Lord met me. Why? Because I chose to press in instead of pulling back. I guarantee you, the Holy Spirit did it for me. He's going to do it for you. It's a battle, and it's a battle for our sons. It's a battle for our daughters, our co-workers. It's a battle for the guy that's bagging your groceries at the supermarket. Each of us has a part in this battle, and what is it called? Ministry. Ministry. Why? The end result? We're going to introduce people. I want to introduce you to my friend, Jesus Christ. Okay? And it doesn't take much. You may not be able to walk that person to the Lord. I'm talking to a guy that's fixing my door at the hotel and telling him, you know, you tell me about how he's living with his girlfriend, been with her for 10 years, and he's proud. You know? And I'm like, you know, the Lord's going to be really happy when you decide to marry that girl. And I told him, learn it now, son. Jesus Christ is the only way. Do you think I expected him? Let me take the sinner's prayer right now. No. But I sowed the seed. And the Holy Spirit is going to take that seed and he's going to grow that seed. And that young man is going to have to make a decision for the Lord. We are in a battle and it's a battle because that poor guy, he doesn't realize it. But if he says no, his eternal destiny is at best hell on the lake of fire. This is as good as it gets. We're in that battle. We have a privilege. John chapter 4, verse 35. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Jesus says, look around, guys. Lift up your eyes. The fields are white for harvest. People around you are hurting. They may be smiling, but was anybody here really, really, really happy before they came to the Lord? No. No. If you're honest, there was a gaping hole in here that could not be filled. We tried to fill it, but it didn't work. The world says people are going to know us by our love. It's because of, because of Jesus that he first loved us that we're able to get out there. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ compels us. It's the love of Christ which compels us. It's pushing us forward, driving us to ministry. Jesus' love is why I share him with other people. Hey, it's why we endure. It's why we continue in ministry. Because Jesus rescued me. He pulled me out of that pit that I called my life. And I got to tell you, it was pretty bad. He snatched each and every one of us, and now you have a mission. But... This is where I want to clarify something, because we have a lot of changes going on. If you're in ministry right now, I'm talking to the seasoned, the seasoned Christians. If you're in ministry and you feel like, you know what? I don't think this is the ministry God called me to. It's okay. <coughs> ministry should feel like your favorite shirt. It should be a perfect fit. When God places you in a perfect, play, in a perfect fit, it's going to be the perfect spot because God's putting there. Why? Wherever the Lord places you, he's going to equip you for it. He's going to give you the gifts, the abilities, the desires that you're going to need to do that ministry. And they're all, they're all going to be divinely suited for your calling. If you have the ability to play a musical instrument or sing like a rock star, where do you think he's going to send you? I doubt if it's going to be the nursery. You're going to be looking at the instruments up here going, yeah, that's what I want to do. You're going to be in ministry because that's the ministry that you are perfectly suited for. The Lord is not going to send a person to the mission field. I love this one because it's perfect. It's absolutely true. Who doesn't like bugs? He's going to send the Christian version of Steve Irwin, the new Christian crocodile hunter. And you know what? That Christian's going to love it. Why? He's going to put all the little fascinations in him for everything that creeps, crawls, or is going to bite you. You know, he's going to look at that and say, that's amazing. That's his ministry. God's put everything in there, and he's equipped him. 
It's okay to try different ministries. When you get to the right ministry, the Lord is going to, in here, you'll get the confirmation, I really like this. I really like this. Why? Because that's your place in the body of Christ. But what do we do? We need to stay engaged. The only way you're going to find the perfect fit, keep trying on the t-shirt. You know, that's the only way. It's okay to work in the parking lot and go, it's just not me. But at least you're engaged. You're up in the front. You're trying to do ministry. Trust me, the Lord will not let you down. Is it always going to be calm water and smooth sailing? No. But there's going to be a day coming when Satan's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. We're all going to be in heaven, and it's going to be good. Satan's no match for Jesus. In the end, we win. Everything works for good. When we're looking back, we're going to be thankful. You know what we're going to be thankful of? He put me in ministry. And I don't care what your ministry is. You could be changing diapers. That is your ministry. That's what the Lord has you doing. Thankful that God allows you to be used. Thankful that he poured out his love on other people through us. That's the end game. Why? So we have fruit. All of this, just like Josiah. Here's your five bucks, kiddo. Nice job. Who did the job? He's doing the job. All we're doing is showing up. Last point, and it's real quick. When they went into the promised land, it wasn't heaven. All the big enemies are out there. What they have to do? Show up. Show up. God didn't say when you go in there and you fight them and you beat them. When you go in there and I give this land to you, the battle belongs to the Lord. We walk in and we walk into these ministries and we think this is such a battle. Ministry is fun. If you're in the ministry the Lord's placed you in, it's fun. Why? Because we get to die to self, loving Jesus, loving others. Each and every one of you is living epistles. All you got to do is let Jesus live through you. Why? So that people can sit there, they can look at you and say, I want some of what he has. They're going to see it. How do you do that? Ministry. Amen? Amen. Pastor Angel, you want to close? Thank you. Thank you guys for putting up with me first. All right, let's take it to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we get out of here, Lord, I just pray that you'll take that word, Lord, and that we'll just munch on it, Lord, that we'll sit there and we'll just think about it and think about it, Lord, and that you'll give each and every one of us our right place in ministry as you see fit. Father, use us, Lord. Use our abilities. Build us up. Build our character, Lord. Every bit of us, we give, we give it to you, Lord. For your purposes, Father, you get the glory. Thank you for the time tonight, Lord. Bless everybody as they get on the road and get home. Give them a safe drive, Lord. Traveling mercies, Lord, and a beautiful night's sleep, Lord. Even the kids. In Jesus' name, Lord, thank you for the service. Amen. Amen. Amen.